everybody for joining us. Um, I heard some of you making nice comments at the beginning about the lab session, so that's nice to hear. Um, and those of you that, that were there did really well, so that was good. Um, we're just going to go through the various um, career routes today, how you might get into the profession. Um, and for those of you who aren't sure whether you want to be in the profession or not, the steps that you might want to take to get there. So. And my slides won't move now. <laughs> that will move now. Routes to registration showing. Brilliant. Thanks, Lucy. Mine's still stuck on the other screen, so it's clearly going to be one of those sessions, isn't it? So, <laughs> routes to registration, hopefully everybody is familiar with these. So, we have the placements that you can complete during university. And, and I know some of you that are here today are going to go on to do placements or might have already completed a placement. So that is a placement where you would do your IBMS registration portfolio. And that gives you your certificate of competence, um, which can then be used to gain HDPC registration and become a registered biomedical scientist. So that's what you need to be able to apply for trainee BMS post graduate. If you don't do that, that's fine. That doesn't mean you can't become a BMS. You could also go on to take up um, a medical laboratory assistant post, an associate practitioner post, or a trainee BMS post that doesn't require the portfolio after graduation. Those trainee BMS routes are quite few and far between, unfortunately, um, but MLA posts and AP posts are much more common. And depending on the type of lab that you're in, they might give you the option to do the training required to become a BMS. Now, for people who don't have an IBMS accredited degree, they might need to do top-up modules after they graduate. Now, for all of you doing biomedical science at Salford, your degree is already IBMS accredited. And um, Lucy and the rest of the programme team put in a lot of hard work to make sure your degree was IBMS accredited, so that's great for you. But if you're on another degree, perhaps the wildlife degrees or biology, for example, and you're now changing your mind and thinking you might want to work as a biomedical scientist after graduation, that's fine. Again, it's not the end for you. You don't need to worry about going back to university full time as a student, unless, of course, you want to. And um, you can do top up modules after you finish your degree. So, for the people who do top up modules in my lab, and I imagine it's the same for Danny and Tamina, um, people normally study and work full time, and um, so they do their study in part time around their job. Has anyone got any questions about routes to registration at this point just before we move on? I'll give everyone a second to type. I've run around like a lunatic this morning, so I'm just <laughs> sit my son Pellegrino. This is the closest to holiday I've got for quite a while. No? Okay, I'll move on then. Lucy, will you just let me know if my slides changed okay, your end? Yeah, that general lab structure is up now. Okay, brilliant, thank you. And again, this hopefully will be familiar to some of you and those of you who come along to the regular talks that we have. But for those of you that aren't familiar about the type of roles I've just been talking about, we have medical laboratory assistants, which are normally a band two or band three, um, they take out a lot of the roles, sort of booking on samples, sorting specimens that come in, answering phone queries and, and general housekeeping in the lab. Um, it's a very busy role and without the MLAs, I'm sure the intermediate would agree we both flounder. Um, but it's a good stepping stone to get into the lab if that's the type of position that you need to get into. Then some labs, mainly the bigger labs, have associate practitioner job roles. So this is, as you can see, a step between the MLA and the BMS posts. Um, associate practitioners are normally around band four, um, dependent on the lab that they're in, and they tend to carry out more of the technical duties. So, things like um, the upkeep and maintenance of the analyzers. They do a lot of what the BMS will do, but without the validation step. So the part that you need to be registered to do, an AP obviously can't do, but they tend to be more tailored training roles towards becoming a BMS. 
Then we have the BMS position that as graduates um, you will be eligible to apply for. Um, a trainee post where you might go through your portfolio with the lab or if you've already got your portfolio then you're a step ahead and you can apply for registered BMS posts. And then from there you complete further study within the lab to become a specialist BMS and then a senior BMS. Yes, so we're just going to chat through now our own individual career routes. So I'll do mine and then I think Danny's is next. So we'll have to do a little bit of laptop passing around and then we'll go back to Tamina. So hopefully the sound issues stay OK. So it's just to try and illustrate to you that we've all taken quite different routes and all of those routes have got us to where we want to be um, and to try and put you at ease about where you might be in your own career path and planning and deciding what to do with yourself after university. So I did my undergraduate degree at Keele and I graduated in 2015 with an applied biomedical science degree. So my degree type changed partway through my degree because I did a 14 week IBMS placement. So I rotated around all the different disciplines within pathology and I completed my registration portfolio while I was there. So I did that during my second year of university. It works slightly differently at Salford because you take a year out between your second and third year. Um, but there are options to do the 14 week placements at some trusts across the UK, although they're quite rare. And um, so people tend to do the year out. And the year out has its benefits because Obviously, you have much more experience in the lab, um, and that tends to mean that you're more competent after than somebody like myself who did a 14 week placement. I was really lucky that someone was retiring just as I was graduating, so I managed to get a trainee BMS post to start the same week as I finished university. And I then moved to a registered BMS post, and um, once I had received my certificate of competence, I moved to Royal Stoke, which is a big trauma centre. So when you first leave university and there's that gap between having finished your exams but not being sure what grade you've got or whether you've passed, you can only work as a trainee rather than a registered BMS because you won't actually have the certificate of competence until that point. So since September 2015, I've been working as a registered BMS. Um, Three and a half years later, I did my specialist portfolio with the IBMS. Oh, my slides are moving for themselves. If someone else has just moved. Done for today. Routes to registration. General. <laughs> Thank you. And I don't think that's me because I didn't touch it, so we'll see how that goes. <laughs> um, so, specialist BMS since December 2018, and at the same time, our lab was expanding and merging with other labs. So I was taken on as a deputy senior BMS. That is a fancy way of saying you help the senior BMSs with no extra money. Um, so I've been working as a deputy senior BMS since December 2018. And I went on to do further study after that. I did a haematology specific masters. I did that at the University of Chester. And most recently I did the IBMS higher specialist diploma. So I've worked my way up through the lab with different qualifications, different rankings within the lab and um, a mixture of classic academic qualifications and work based qualifications like HSD. And that's got me to where I am now. So I'm going to pass you over now. I'll put my mask on as I'm moving about. I'm going to pass the laptop back over to Danny. So excuse while I'm moving around the room, please. And we'll do Danny's career route next. Amy, can I ask you a question? Yeah. <laughs> um, the the um, after your degree, the the um, the additional qualms that you have, are they IBMS accredited? And is it important for students to make sure that the courses all are accredited? Yeah. yeah. So um, my specialist diploma and higher specialist diploma are both IBMS approved qualifications. So they are IBMS accredited. You can do masters that are IBMS approved, but you tend to need those if you haven't already got a registration portfolio or a position within a lab. So I actually did 
a haematology master's that isn't RDMS accredited because I didn't need the RDMS approval to get into the career route, if that makes sense. So I just picked the master's that was most interesting to me and most specific to the career I was doing. But there are options out there to do an RDMS accredited master's, which would give you that stepping stone if you weren't already in the lab. Thanks, Amy. Well, thanks, Lucy. I'll hand you over to Danny. Hi everyone again. Uh, thank you for having me back. Um, so my my career journey started actually in the NHS back in 2008, uh, which is when I was 15. I'd left school, uh, and I actually got a job as a receptionist in a GP surgery, my own GP surgery, um, and that was my first introduction to working in any healthcare system um, in in the NHS. And um, prior to that, I had no aspirations to go into healthcare. I um, don't think I really knew what I wanted to do at that point, but it was that exposure to, um, to primary care and some exposure to secondary care in the NHS that they got me thinking about possible careers in the NHS. And, and even then, um, my, my, first, my, first, um, my first degree uh, wasn't actually in biomedical science. I, 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 I left the surgery after being inspired by some of the student nurses and student doctors that were coming through the surgery on placements. Um, and I actually went off to, to, to Salford Uni to be nursing. Um, so I studied two years of adult nursing before, um, if we don't sugarcoat it, dropping out. I dropped out of uni. Um, I dropped out in the April of 2014 and I rejoined Salford again in the September for the, for the new academic year to study biomedical science. So. Um, relative to Amy, um, Amy's got a few years experience on me actually, uh, because in 2014 that's when I started my biomedical science journey, my biomedical science degree. Um, so I did the accredited biomedical science program here, I did the four year, um, four year version of the course, so I did two years, uh, first year, second year, then I did a placement year and then my final year uh, made my fourth year. So. In between years two and three, um, probably like some of you here and some of you, what you what, what you have planned, I, I did a placement. Um, it was at the Hematology and Transfusion Laboratory at Manchester Foundation Trust. Um, really enjoyed that, and actually, I've, I've stayed in the remit of Hematology and Transfusion ever since. Um, I, grad I graduated 2018, um, picked up my first job as a registered BMS. So. Um, that was um, a band five registered biomedical scientist post uh, and really because I'd spent a year already working in the lab and it was the same discipline I, I got off to a really good start and um, it was very similar equipment very similar computer systems and obviously the hematology and the transfusion doesn't really change much fundamentally so um, I was able to progress fairly quickly um, and within a few months I'd, um, I'd picked up a specialist post um, which just just for the just to be clear, it's, that isn't necessarily normal or um, what to expect. You know, uh, my, my plan was to work as a registered biomedical scientist for maybe two years, do a specialist qualification similar to Amy, then progress to a specialist BMS, maybe two, three years, then think about a senior role. But a little bit like Amy, um, the stars aligned, people retired, um, and everything just worked in my favor to enable me to progress, really. And uh, I progressed fairly quickly and before long I then moved um, into another specialist role at a different hospital, again, hematology and um, fusion at Milton Keynes. Um, stayed there for almost a year um, before I then picked up my first senior biomedical science role, biomedical scientist role back here in Manchester um, at one of the private hospitals. Um, and you're starting to see the pattern now. I, I don't stay around for long. I try and progress uh, fairly quickly. And I, I stayed at that hospital for almost a year, not quite a year. Um, and um, I went off to the NHS Blood and Transplant. And that's where I'm at now. I, I work as a patient blood management practitioner. Um, no longer in the laboratory, although uh, registration as a biomedical scientist is still required. And uh, that's essential for my role. Um, and now um, I work in more of a education um, advisory role. Um, I work quite closely with hospitals um, 
that are going through policy changes, uh, designing large or, large national audits. Um, we provide specialist transfusion advice to clinicians, laboratories, and help them um, help them on, on their way to uh, redesign their policies for continuous improvement. Um, so a very different role, a uh, very different role to um, Amy's, a um, very different role to, to Mina's, but I think that's what's really going to be really useful about this session is that we've got three BMSs up here who've all sorts of taken different paths uh, and have different specialisms uh, to share with you. So um, I'm going to be quiet now and pass over to Tamina, but um, whilst I'm here, you know, I, there's no sensitive questions for me, so I get the most out of this session. If you want to ask me about pay, if you want to ask me about what I don't like about the job, regrets, anything, ask, there's, there's nothing, there's nothing um, that, um, that I, I find offensive or too sensitive to ask. So please get the most out of this session. Um, I, I'm now going to do what Amy just did and pass the laptop back over to Amy um, and then bring it over to Tamina. Um, yes. your, your slide is um it just had the the title on uh, i'm not sure if that, that was the intention or, or if this text is supposed to appear yeah amy, amy tested me she she didn't give me anything to work off so i had to uh, i had to freestyle there a little bit lucy i think that's my copy oh, no, slide. Right. Okay. <laughs> just, um, you yeah 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 that. i think tamina's might be the same as well lucy no worries thank you yes. Nina was on the ball and got it over. <laughs> so I'm just moving okay. over to Tamina. Can you see that okay, Lucy? Yep. Yeah. We're moving charges around. <laughs> Okay, can everyone hear me, yeah? Yes, we can, yeah. Okay, um, so yes, I started my degree in at um, Manchester Metropolitan University in 2007. Um, I kind of went into biomedical science without realising uh, what it actually was. It was, I just found it really interesting, so I thought I'll go for that. Um, and then when I started the degree into my second year, uh, we were told about a 12-month placement uh, to complete the IBMS registration portfolio. Um, and again, I didn't realise how important it was at the time. Um, I had just got engaged um, and I didn't actually really want to do the placement, but my mum made me do it. <laughs> so I went to the Christie in 2009, completed a 12 month placement there. Uh, um, and then I left there at, in 2010, went back to university to complete my final year. Uh, and I'm just so glad that I went for the placement really because Straight after my final exam, um, once I walked out of the hall and switched off, switched on my phone, I had a message from um, the manager at Christie, and she's basically offering me a job to get in there as the, an MLA. Um, I rang her back, um, and I did ask her if we got a biomedical scientist position. And she said, uh, "We do have one coming up soon, but just get your foot in the door. Uh, we've got this MLA position that we'd really like you to take." So I took that. Um, and I worked for six months um, as an MLA, and then six months later there was that biomedical scientist position um, that she told me about. So I applied for that. It was actually in biochemistry though, so the placement that I completed my registration portfolio in, um, the discipline was haematology and transfusion. Um, and then this biomedical scientist position came up in biochemistry. So again, I asked the same question because I really wanted to kind of stick to haematology and transfusion. So I spoke to the manager and just asked, is there nothing in hematology and transfusion and she said again we're all um, kind of working towards becoming cross-disciplined and um, so we can become blood sciences but she said I wouldn't worry about not working in hematology and transfusion for now because we're working towards that anyway so I did that for about a year in biochemistry and then there was a position that came up in hematology and transfusion um, and I just kind of became cross-trained in all of the departments um, so that's where blood sciences, biomedical sciences comes in. Um, and then I went on to complete the specialist diploma in haematology and transfusion, um, and I completed that in 2015. Um, I went on maternity leave, and then when I came back, um, I asked if I could do my master's in haematology and transfusion, and again, work supported me for that. Um, and I completed that in 2019. 
um, and at the same time I was completing my training qualification, which is the direction that I've got in. Um, and then that allowed me to apply for a senior position as team manager and the training officer. Since then, I've gone on to complete qualifications in quality management and just recently finished um, my leadership and management course. Um, but in the meantime, over the last 12 months, I've kind of got involved with working with IBMS a bit more closely. Um, so the registration portfolio the co that you complete on the placement, um, I've become a verifier for those. Um, I also complete the examinations for the specialist portfolios, um, the degree assessments for any um, sort of non-accredited degrees that uh, the students have completed. Um, I'm also a CPD officer. So when you become um, a registered biomedical scientist, your, uh, si when you sign your registration um, statement, every couple of years, you've got to kind of agree that you'll be maintaining your CPD. Um, and then I'm also an, ass an assessor for the equivalence route. So any students who haven't kind of done the registration portfolio, um, but they have the equivalent experience they can submit evidence and we will assess that and kind of decide if the um if the person is sort of ready to become a biomedical scientist um, i've also just uh, joined the science council registration authority committee um, and um yeah so just getting a bit more involved in terms of policies uh, training and quality and things like that really um, and yeah I'm just really enjoying kind of working with the IBMS quite closely because I want to help more of the students coming out of university and sort of increase the chances of employability um, so yeah that's where I am at the moment uh, I'll hand it over to Amy again to me now yeah to, to your list of activities but um, Perhaps it's appropriate to add independent assessor for um, uh, biomedical science apprenticeships. Uh, health and science degree apprenticeships, yeah. So I'm also an independent assessor okay. to, um, yeah, for the endpoint assessment for apprenticeship students. Um, That's it. I did one recently for the University of Staffordshire uh, and I've also done it for the University of Oxford as well. Um, any questions? Okay, I'll hand over to Amy. Thank you. Hope everyone's enjoying seeing me running around Peel with a laptop. The most exercise I've done for months. Okay. So, if anyone's got any questions at that point about any of our career routes, like Danny said, none of us are precious about the questions you ask us, so feel free to, um, to fire away about them. I've just seen one come in. Are there any ethical or moral issues slash warnings when being a biomedical scientist specialising in haematology and transfusion? For example, dealing with stem cells, etc. What I might do then is pass this between us if that's okay. Um, so obviously enjoying running around with the laptop. <laughs> so for me, um, a big one in haematology, and those of you who were looking at the blood films this morning in the lab will know that. If you work in the area where you live, or in my case, the area where you grew up and have always lived, sometimes you see patients' results that you know. So I have found out before now that my cousin was pregnant by having her blood sampling, not by her telling me. Um, I've found out the same thing about friends. I've found, you know, my friend's dad, unfortunately, he had leukemia. And I knew before her because I had her the blood film in for him so i would say for me that's a big ethical and moral issue that we come across um, and something that we have to be really careful of guarding patient confidentiality with um, because of course that's not ours to tell people that's for the patient to tell um, and really we are only involved in that news on a need to know basis for our work um, it wouldn't then be my place to go to my friend's dad, for example, oh, I knew you had leukemia before you did because I knew because of the nature of my work, not because it was my friend's dad. Does that make sense? So if I go, should I go to Danny next? And then Tamina come to you after. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll spin around then. Uh, 
Dial into the online dial into the chat, yeah. I could see you on my screen, yeah. <laughs> um, so really good question, first of all. And it's really good that you're thinking about those kind of things. And um, I'll just firstly pick up the stem cell part because I know that's quite a pertinent, uh, pertinent issue, especially when we talk about uh, medical ethics. Um, and I think when I look across this room and I see uh, Tamina and, and, and Amy and, and myself, we, we're, we're, we very much work in diagnostics. Um, rather than in research roles, and I think I think at the core of your question probably relates more towards um, the scope and the potential of use of, of stem cells and how they might be used in the future. Um, so I, whilst um, whilst I, I appreciate it's a really good question, I'm not sure that that sort of ethical issue is something that I consider too much in my role because I'm not actually involved too much with it. Um, but I think Amy made some really good points. Um, and I think the one thing I take away from that and the one thing I try and um, really um, emphasize in training and, and definitely in early training is that you, as, a, as a healthcare professional, whatever your role is, you, you, you're in a very, it, it, seems, uh, it seems kind of odd to say privileged position, but you, you, you do get that information before a family. You know, I know about life changing news before the family, before the patient who it's going to affect. And that's quite, a, that's quite heavy. Um, so there are some ethical issues to consider there, and um, a lot of it um, is around, like Amy said, it's about um, respecting that individual, respecting that family, and, and only using that information that you get from your privileged position uh, to support the care of that patient. And um, if you've all got pens and paper, I think one note that I would ask you to take down is to look at the Caldicott Principles. Um, and the Caldicott Principles uh, is a really interesting piece. And, it's around how we use and share information, how we store information, and only using information that we get through this privileged position um, to better care for our patients and for no other reason. Um, so I think the, 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 the key one is around respecting confidentiality, respecting uh, the dignity of patients and families, um, and you know, only using, storing, and sharing information that you get from your privileged to support the care of the patients that you're looking after. Um, and I think if you stick to that as a, as a general rule throughout your career, um, you can go too far off. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and again, I kind of came across, I was on a, a late shift on my own actually, and obviously I received a sample and I knew her really well, she used to come to our house, and we were kids, and I'd just seen her name and her date of birth and the address, and you know, first thing that comes to head is, oh my god, is she okay? And I knew she was downstairs, and I, just got, I can't really go down and see her, um, so it was really hard, um, but again, you know, you know that you're kind of bound by these rules um, and you've got to be sensitive. Um, so yeah, I just have to keep it for myself because again, protecting confidentiality. Um, and then obviously a couple of weeks later, once she'd had her final diagnosis, um, you know, the news was kind of given to our family. Um, my mum knew and then she'd obviously passed on to her best friend that I work at the Christie, I work in the lab site, she processed the samples. Um, in a way, they kind of used to get in touch with me every time she came to a place so I could go down. Um, I guess it was more of a support really. Um, but her mum and dad were really worried about her. So every time she used to come in to give her blood samples, her mum would ring me and ask, what do the results mean if you process them? Can you do this urgently? And it was really difficult because they don't have that background knowledge, um, you know, in terms of what we do in the lab, how we work, and they don't understand that. Confidentiality side of things. Um, and it was just really tough. She'd ring me while I was working in the lab, and eventually, I think um, when she rang me, I knew that she was ready to let me know, so I just stopped answering her calls because I didn't want to be in that difficult position. Um, and then she rang my mom, 
she said, oh, can you just help me to answer the role so I can ask some questions? I had to kind of really explain it, but explain it from clarify that, you know, I'm bound to try this um, and I can't just have to explain to her that I'm not allowed and I really hope she understands. I can come down, provide support and everything, and, you know, but I can't go into the results specifically to explain what they might actually mean. Um, they did understand. Um, it was just really difficult and I, I suppose it's a sensitive time for everyone. Um, but at the same time, where you know it's about maintaining professionalism. Uh, yes, that's one example of where I've come across. Um, and she does come back for checkups actually, um, but she's fine now. Positive outcome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. A bit of a of it. I think whichever specialism you work in with pathology, you'll always come across. You know the risk of running into somebody you know even if you don't see them in person the way a doctor or a nurse might do and um, it's always good if you can to try and avoid dealing with those type of samples for somebody that you know and um, but of course like Tamina's case if she's the only BMS there you can't do that and um, I've had cases where my granddad was an inpatient and I've asked other people to process blood films for example and um, but yeah it's about maintaining as both Tamina and Danny said, that professional registration and understanding our registration requirements and why we can't reach those. I'll take my mask off again now so you can see me a little clearer. So hopefully that answers your question, Jessica. Um, if anybody else has got other questions leading off that, feel free to, to drop them in the chat. So I, I wanted to move on now to talking about the IBMS registration portfolio. So Unless you've been in the labs, this is a bit of an enigma to people and um, we don't necessarily understand why it's so important. So the IBMS registration portfolio is a piece of 30 pieces of evidence that compile into one big folder and they show your lab competency. So they show that you understand the principles like confidentiality and the principles related to samples, why we have to check barcodes, why we check patient identifiers and all of the bases that are covered by lab work. There's quite a lot of reflective writing throughout, reflecting on your experiences within the lab and I've put a link there so that you can access um, an example copy. Now the reason that you can only do this in an IBMS approved training lab is because to get those pieces of evidence to show competence to show that you've been in the scenarios that you'll experience as a biomedical scientist, you really need to be in the thick of it in the lab. So as much as we can simulate it like we did this morning, diagnosing blood cancers, for example, you will never get the same experience as you will have been within a lab on placement or after your degree. So that's why when students say to me, can't you get me through the registration portfolio, I would love to and I would love for everybody to have the opportunity to do it, but the lab side of things is so important to it. Now, if you're offered the opportunity to do an IBMS registration portfolio and perhaps you are offered a placement in hematology and you think after your degree actually I want to work in histology, I would still encourage you to take it um, because the IBMS registration is generic to all disciplines. So it doesn't matter whether you complete it in history or microbiology, you will be able to work as a registered BMS in whichever discipline you want. Of course, it has its advantages to have experience within each area, um, but it's not essential. So thinking about the IBMS registration portfolio and why it's so important. Having the IBMS registration portfolio is what allows you to apply for your certificate of competence after graduation or if you've already graduated on completion of your IBMS registration portfolio um, and that allows you to become HCPC registered and as I've already said it can only be completed in IBMS approved training laboratories for those reasons. So myself and Tamina both um, verify the registration portfolios and obviously Danny has gone through it himself and um, so has anybody got any questions about the registration portfolio at this point? <laughs> yeah of course it is Tamina. Tamina's put in the chat that haematology and transfusion is the best discipline which obviously all three of us think that it is. Um, 
but don't let us skew you one way or the other. You've got to go and try these things out for yourself. Lucy, are there any questions at that point you think we need to cover? Um, it's quite difficult because of BMS, because you think this is like a second nature to us. Yeah, I, I guess uh, getting um, that 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 placement onto um, uh, to you know to to be able to undertake the registration portfolio that's so critical. But they they are quite competitive to get on, aren't they? Um, they uh, just are, yeah. if you had any advice to kind of how people can shine in this. I mean, maybe it's outside this session, really, but. Uh, you know, just any quick words of advice on how to kind of stand above the rest in terms of the applications. Yeah, I think I should cover that now. I think I'll be going to build up. So I'll spin you back round to Danny first, and then I'll do to me, and then I'll do mine at the end. Because it will obviously apply to uh, getting noticed for for registration portfolio, but it is I'm sure it'll be good advice for applying for jobs generally as well. Yeah, absolutely. And so a lot of this actually would be transferable into, into that, Lucy. So a lot of the, the, the key principles remain the same. And um, I think one of the, the, the greatest challenges that you will see as a student applying for these roles as undergraduates is that you're all very, and, and I'm talking about trying to, to stand out at this point, you're all very early on in your career. You've all done the same thing in year one. Uh, you apply for your placement in year two. So when you're thinking about all the um, all the qualities and experiences that you are trying to show off in your CVs and your cover letters, a lot of it is going to be the same because uh, between you as a cohort, because that's uh, for many of you, you'll have left your A levels, you'll have come to university, and this is this is your career so far. Um, so my, my the, the biggest thing that the easiest thing you can do is is look at trying to get these one percent advantages and. Call them one percent advantages because at the time that you do them, it seems like a lot of work, but very little return. And one of the being here today and going to that last session this morning for those who did is one of these one percenters. It's it's one percent more than somebody who didn't do it in the same position as you. Okay, so and there's lots of opportunities to at university to do that. Being involved with the uh, accredited society, uh, affiliated society that you've got here, the IBMS affiliated society. Uh, being a student rep, uh, being involved with the institute, uh, networking, all these little things can add up and really beef out your cover letter. And when you've got 100 of the same cover letters coming from Salford Uni, but you've got three or four of them, maybe more, hopefully more, that have got all these extra activities on, straight away you're standing out. So whilst it does seem like a lot of work to, you know, to get up early on a Friday once the term's finished to go and do another lab session, that's not, not, not actually um, mandated to it very worthwhile. Um, my second piece of advice, because I think we're going to have very, lots of similar advice, so I'll stop after this one, let somebody else come in, but when you're applying for a registration portfolio, remember that it's not a specialist job, so you might have an interest in hematology and transfusion, you might be interested in microbiology, but as Lucy said, these are very competitive, um, competitive opportunities, so if you do come across an opportunity to go and do your registration portfolio in microbiology, that doesn't necessarily mean you're bound to microbiology for the rest of your career. Because whether you're at microbiology, hematology, biochemistry, the registration portfolio is built around fundamental laboratory skills and principles. Um, so you're not necessarily learning about the, the specialist, specialist, um, specialist theme and specialist testing. Um, that's, not, that's not the point of the registration portfolio. You will get exposure to that as part of the placement. That's the fun part. But the, the main objective of doing the registration portfolio is about the fundamentals of biomedical science. And you will get that from any laboratory. What you can do then is decide where you want to specialize. And that's where your specialist diploma will come in. So don't worry too much about the specialism for now. Um, it's all about you're learning those fundamental skills that will follow you throughout your career. You can specialize later. Um, and, it, and it happens. People will train in one different discipline and then move on to another discipline and another maybe. Or you might even change halfway through your career. That's okay. Um, so I could go on, but I'm sure that Tamina and Amy have the same sorts of advice because it's all very, it's all very, um, very much the same. So I'll, I'll go to Amy or Tamina, I'll let Amy decide. And, uh, yeah. yeah. 
the student members? Um, yes, uh, because what it shows is that you're actually engaged with the profession. Having even just having that awareness that each student membership exists uh, is one thing. But actually, with each student membership, you're you're actually engaging with the profession. You're engaging with the professional body uh, that's actually accrediting these degrees. So yes, absolutely. And for the sake of a tenor um, that will follow you through your studies, absolutely worthwhile doing. It's another line that you could add into your cover letter. You know. I'm a student at the University of Salford and an East student member of the Institute of Biomedical Science. Sounds a lot better than just a student at the University of Salford, doesn't it? So, yes, Lucy, 100%. Brilliant. Thanks, Danny. <laughs> Slides have started changing on their own again. I'll pass you over to Tamina um, to answer the question about how to get ahead with um, placements or job applications. Tanina, you've, you're very quiet. We can hardly hear you. Sorry. Is that better, Lucy? Much. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, yeah, so one of the things I've been involved in recently is um, recruitment. Um, and you have to do their placements. Um, so I had the application sent through to me from the placement tutor uh, with a CV and a cover letter. And it was really difficult because we had about 20, 20 to 25, um, and we had to kind of shortlist them down to about six. So we were planning on taking one student in histology and one in blood sciences. Um, histology chose two shortlisted two, so we were able to choose four. And even then, I think I couldn't decide between, I got them down to about seven and I couldn't decide um, which four I wanted. So I passed it on to a different, um, another senior biomedical scientist, asked them to look through it, and then we managed to get the list down to four. Um, and it was things in the cover letter and the CV that stood out were things like um, knowledge of the discipline that they wanted to work in. So a lot of them specified blood sciences. Uh, which kind of stood out to me but then at the same time going into um, specifically like transfusion talking about knowledge of um, the products FFP and cryoprecipitate and um, one of the students um, mentioned that she had set up an Instagram page where she does blogs on biomedical science um, so I checked it out on Instagram um, just getting some feedback is everyone on mute? Yes, so I checked it out and I was really impressed. We definitely made it onto the shortlist. Um, so we interviewed them a couple of weeks ago and some of the advice I can give you is definitely do some research background on the um, hospital that you want to go and work for. Um, so out of those six, I think only two were able to answer um, when we asked them a question, um, what do you know about our hospital? Four of them didn't really do any research, and two of them were really good. Um, some of the other questions we asked were, what do you know about um, health and safety rules? Um, and again, I think only three were able to answer those questions. Um, we asked things like, what kind of work experience have you got that might be relevant? Um, so one that I particularly remember was, he basically answered with not having much experience that's relevant. But then when we got to a question at the end and we said, what um, kind of process have you been involved in in terms of customer service? He started talking about um, working for a call center with the NHS, you know, for the COVID testing. Um, and that was actually relevant to the previous question, um, but he failed to answer that. Um, and it was just a shame, really. Um, so the kind of things that you need to look out for is everything that you've learned in your um, first and second year before the placement, kind of revise the key points that you've learned uh, do some background reading on the lab um, and definitely health and safety procedures and things there are general questions like um, your work experience things where you've um, been involved in in terms of improving procedures so he had a couple who worked in the kitchen and they talked about the flow of when the orders come in and how to get kind of the meals ready and things and it's all relevant even though it's not working in a healthcare setting 
but it's where you showed initiative to kind of suggest a change and bring about improvements. Is that all right? Um, have we got any more questions? Okay, I'll hand you back over to Amy. Thanks, Tamina, that was great. What, what I've been doing is that I've just made a few notes on what you've been saying, so I'm just going to post those in the comments. It's not another question, it's just notes. Oh, brilliant. Okay, thanks, Lucy. Yeah, so building on what Danny and Tamina have said, I mean, I'd echo everything that they've already said, but um, Tamina mentioned about the Instagram, um, and I think... You know, a, a couple of you are already on Twitter and engaging with it, but I think that's a big way into it now. Um, I have seen students get placements just by asking for one on Twitter. There's the IBMS chat that they do every month, and I know a couple of you have been involved in that in the past. There's the IBMS branch meetings, whether it's Manchester, North Staff, or National. Um, and of course, all of the IBMS opportunities that stem from that, like Congress too. Um, just got a question from Morgan. For interviews for placements, um, like you said, they were impressed knowing the values of the hospital. Your interview for health and safety was a big one too. Yeah, so Morgan um, Morgan has recently interviewed for placements at Salford and has been successful. So um, Morgan did a really good presentation um, about you know different routes and um, issues that were coming up with COVID. So good to know Morgan that they were impressed with you and um, the values of the hospital and health and safety too that's definitely a big one and I imagine for both of you that, yeah yeah so health and safety just just knowing that you're going to have a placement student who you don't have to explain to them that they need to wear a lab coat or to tie their hair up in the lab for example it takes you from having essentially a big child on a placement to having an adult on a placement and that's what you want isn't it you know professional placement so yeah that's a good point Morgan so that feeds quite nicely um really into the next bit that we were going to cover and um, how you can get ahead of the crowd so um to be in it just put a comment in the chat about um knowledge of basic PPE can make a big difference um, and that's certainly a way that you can get yourself ahead it links in well with what Danny was saying of so taking the extra labs and um, these are a couple of points that I would think of as, as how you can get ahead of yourself. So getting involved with the IBMS, I think we've already covered this really, but the student membership and the IBMS Manchester branch are big ones there. I got in touch with a lot of labs and asked um, if I could go around them. Before I graduated, I'd gone around maybe three or four different labs. Um, and just having the confidence to ask questions while you're there, I know how daunting it can be. And myself, Danny and Tamina have all been through what you're going through now. Um, but I promise you, it's nice as a BMS working in the labs to be asked questions about what you do. And um, it's nice to see somebody listening rather than thinking, oh no, am I really boring them? Um, so if you get in touch with the labs and ask for tours, I appreciate it's difficult during COVID, but some of them are still running virtual tours and um, some of them will be happy to have a conversation on the phone or perhaps even Microsoft Teams. And you're getting your name out there then, you're getting yourself known. And if they see an application from you or they see you as an interview, you know, the likelihood is they'll recognise you and they'll appreciate the efforts that you went to previously to try and get yourself ahead. So. That's a big one that I would say. Did, did you do anything like that, Danny or Tamina? Did you go around any lab tours? I'll just turn around to Tamina. Hi, Tamina. Hi, Tamina. Very quiet again. Um, so initially, I said about taking one student on in histology and one in blood sciences. Um, because we were so impressed by the three candidates that did really well, we've actually offered two placements for blood sciences and one in histology. Um, we just thought it, we, we couldn't decide between them who we were going to select, and we just thought it'd be a shame. Um, for them not to get that opportunity. I've just got some feedback in front of me actually and one of the things that really stood out um, from one of the applicants 
was her knowledge on quality. She knew about UCAS accreditation and which standards the lab was accredited to. And that to me really stood out. So we definitely wanted to take her on. Um, there was another candidate who, again, she had some gaps, but then she was able to demonstrate sort of learning from um, experience and knowledge that she's going to gain in the lab. So we knew that it, although she doesn't have the knowledge just yet, we knew that in 12 months time, we can build on that and we could just see the potential. Um, and then another student mentioned um, how she was involved in sort of this program that they do in the labs, putting together practical aspects and things. And she's put herself forward for that. And we were really impressed because we thought, again, if you can bring those ideas into the lab while she's here as a placement student, that, that's beneficial for us as well. We're investing time to train this, um, these students to complete the registration portfolio. Um, so yeah, these are all things that you can kind of um, get involved in to get ahead. The other thing that Amy mentioned was about um, the social media side of things. Like getting involved in terms of, um, especially on Twitter at the moment, there's so much opportunity there to get involved, um, learn, get some experience, um, get some uh, advice, questions. Um, a lot of us do have messages come through, which Danny does as well. Um, to answer questions anyone might have. Um, I'm going to pass you back to Amy. Just um, to, to add my tokens, if, if that's all right, just really quickly. Yeah, I, found, um, I found actually going to the interview itself, even if you've done a bit more homework and you've decided, oh, actually, I'm not sure about this position. I don't think it is for me. But I have actually gone to the interview and you learn so much. Just you get the lab tour anyway in a, by going to the interview and um, you, you learn so much just through going through the process. So uh, I'm not saying I'm not encouraging people to kind of deliberately go to an interview that you've no intention of accepting the position for. But uh, just to say to be brave and kind of go for it and um, you'll enjoy the, the interview process, hopefully, and the experience that that brings. I think that's a really good point. Hopefully, those of you who are here today who've already had your placement interviews or interviews for employment afterwards, I know we've got quite a few who've got BMS posts this year, which is lovely. Um, hopefully you'd be able to feed back to the others that it was actually quite a positive experience. Um, remember that the people interviewing you want to see you do well. They're not interviewing you to try and catch you out or make you feel silly. Um, they don't purposely try to ask you questions that you don't know the answer to. It's to gauge where you're at and to make sure you're the right fit for their lab too. As much as you want the job, um, they have to make sure that you're the right type of person for that role. Um, all my slides are moving again, so on the phone. Um, so yeah, that's that's something important um, to remember. So going back to um, how else you can get ahead, um, I would say having your CV ready is a big one, and we'll go on to that in a moment, um, and how you could get your CV prepared. I've got my CV, part of my CV, to show you as well which is a bit nerve-wracking um, and making the most of the resources thank you and i've just seen that you've posted in the, the chat about interview preparation that's on the student hub there's loads of information on the various careers hubs teams mentoring sites and all of the um, career service um, resources that are available too I've just seen Alia post in the, the chat as well and um, that we also have the BMS day outreach kits that the Biomed Society are working on, which is a great opportunity to get involved with. And um, I don't know, Ali, whether you want to say something about that quickly, um, or if you'd prefer for me to speak on your behalf, you want to just let me know, because um, there's some brilliant stuff that the Biomed Society are doing at the moment, um, and that they've been awarded some funding for from the IBMS. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's fine, Ali, or I'll say so. Um, the committee are working at the moment on outreach packs that are going to go out to primary schools and high schools, and hopefully, once um, COVID regulations are relaxed, um, bring some students onto campus too, to give them a taste of what a you know, biomedical scientist is, raise awareness of the profession, and we've got a little art competition that's going out in 
postal tax um, for a while people can't come and join us on campus. So that's something that Elliot and the rest of the committee are running through the Biomed Society. Um, and I'd really encourage you all to get involved with that if you're interested in becoming a BMS, because that is something that would really stand out on the CV to me. Um, or a covering letter that you've worked in outreach and um, public engagement before you've even finished university. So that's something really important, I would say, to have on there. Has anyone got any more questions about how you can get ahead before we move on to the sort of CV side of things? No? Okay. There'll be plenty of time for questions at the end as well, if anyone um, comes up with anything they wanted to ask. So. Hopefully you can all see a bit of my CV now um, and I'll yep. ask Danny and Tamina afterwards if they'd share any tips from their own CVs. Um, so this is just the, the first sort of couple of paragraphs that you would see on my CV. So my CV is two sides of A4 and um, try not to have it as any more than that I would say um, because people have a lot of CVs to read through for all applications and um, in all honesty, I wouldn't get past that. Um, so try and keep the key information to the top. Um, this is why mine's structured in this way. So I give a brief overview of what I do. So half my week as a BMS and half my week teaching here at Salford. And then I give in bullet points um, the key skills that I have from that and the key experiences that I have. So you can see some of the things I've mentioned on there already about the specialism within, within haematology. I specialise in the morphology and automated sections. So even when you've got a specialism such as haematology, you will then further specialise, like Danny has with patient blood management and transfusion, and like Tamina has with training across all of pathology. Even if you have already specialised, you then hone it in finer and finer, just like your academics do here with research. So I've talked a bit about my experience of teaching, working with a range of students and trainees. Um, I've talked a bit about my work with the IBMS um, and with registration portfolio verification and specialist portfolio examination. I have my HCPC registration number in my CV because it's so important to the profession and it also helps them skip ahead sometimes because any um, professional BMS role will require that registration. As Danny said, even though he's not perhaps on the bench anymore, um, he still needs his HCPC registration. So all employers will want to check that. And then I talk a little bit about active engagement with continuing professional development, which is essential in any career, um, but is something that the IBMS, and BMS in particular, are really hot on. And then to try and cover all bases, I give um, a full list of skills that I use in various roles. And that helps me to tick a lot of the um, person specification requirements. So I'm sure you'd be familiar with job adverts, whether it's for waitressing, MS posts, placements, whatever it is, this will be transferable to all job roles. And um, you'll have a job description, which outlines the type of things you might need to do as part of your job. And you also have a person specification which says you, know, you want to see somebody with a BMS degree. They want to see somebody with an IBMS registration portfolio. And I try to tick off a lot of the boxes there that are in the um, person specific requirements. For example, a desire to succeed, strong communicator, um, verbal and non-verbal communication, all of those sort of things that they want to see ticked off. Um, but that perhaps you don't want to spend paragraphs rambling on about. I've just seen Ian post some more um, useful resources for you in the chat on making applications and your supporting statements. So I'll hand you over to Danny now, if that's okay, for any tips from Danny's CV or CVs that you might have read as part of um, recruitment. So this is going to be applicable whether you're applying for a post using a CV, a cover letter, both NHS jobs, it, it, it's all, it, this advice will be applicable to any of those mechanisms. So the first thing, I'm quite new to shortlisting and, and uh, recruiting, but one of the things that have stood out, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about some of the things that have really stood out to me, which are the, the do nots, and then I guess from there, we'll, to me, they can cover some of the uh, do's, I'm sure she's got a lot more experience with that. So 
one thing that stands out to me is that everybody, every single person ever who's ever applied for a job is a self-motivated person who can work under pressure. Um, but nobody ever provides any sort of evidence to say how they how, how, how they do that. It's, it's, I see it in every um, every application, every cover letter. Um, so if, if you think back to high school and you, when you think about uh, P, point evidence explained, I, I try to use that in both interviews and any cover letters. So if I if I want if I'm going to make a point, um, I want to I also want to evidence how done that and explain how that is even applicable to this role. Um, so when Amy were talking earlier um, about the essentials and desirables in the person specific, don't just say, don't just do bullet points and say, you know, copy and paste the essential and say I'm all of this. List, go use the person specific as direction and take each point and tell me, the recruiter, how you A, meet this point and tell me a time where you've actually Maybe not even the time, but yeah, provide some evidence and some experience to to show how you actually achieve how you actually achieve that essential criteria. Um, second um, second point is don't. It's painfully obvious when somebody's using the same cover letter for every single job they apply for, um, and for the for those who are wish at doing it, sometimes they don't even change the location. Um, I was working in the Lake District. Um, and uh, people obviously were applying for five, 10, 15 jobs uh, using the same cover letter. Um, and people that have always wanted to work in Manchester, but they've applied for a job up in the Lake District. Uh, so when you're putting together a job application, make that job application specific to this job. Obviously, lots of it will be the same, but there's going to be points where the person specific changes slightly or the scope of the role is slightly different. And of course the location is going to be different and the sort of trust uh, specific stuff is going to be different. So uh, the NHS uses uh, sort of value-based recruitment now. So you need to really think about the, the values and the um, and the, um, the, the, the objectives of the particular organization that you're applying to try and encompass them into your application. Um, Really, um, I, I'm not sure it's entirely rolled out yet, uh, but across the NHS, we are moving towards a more trust-based recruitment process. Um, so, what Stephen mentioned earlier about knowing the organisation that you're applying for um, isn't a box exercise where it might have been in the past. You know, do it quickly go on the website 20 minutes before you interview and find out what, what they're about, where did, uh, what what their values are, and trying to remember their sort of cheesy, cheesy, uh, cheesy line about values. It's much more than that now. You need to demonstrate how you fit into that organisation um, as much as the other way around. So, um, there's a couple of my don'ts that I've experienced recently. Um, and I guess the take home message is know what you're applying for and tailor your application to that. Don't just have one CV or one cover letter or one supporting information on HS jobs and send that out everywhere because it's obvious, even if you don't think it is. Thanks. I'll pass over to Tabina now for her. Yep. Yeah, everything what Amy and I have covered so far. Um, and again, I'm going to refer back to um, the recent example that I had when I was interviewing the placement students. Um, one of the things I would say is if you've written in your CV or your cover letter that you've got special interest um, in good sciences or whatever discipline, um, when you're in the interview, don't backtrack because um, then it looks like you've not kind of done your research. Um, we had a particular example where they didn't actually specify in the cover letter about which discipline it was, but then one of the first questions that we asked them was what their interest was in, and then later on in the interview, um, it was completely opposite of what they'd said. Um, actually, there was myself specialising in haematology and transfusion. On the panel, there was a biochemistry senior manager and a histology manager. Um, and the student came out with, oh, I definitely don't want to do histology, you know, good science is my role. But at the same time, you know, you've got to kind of be open to opportunities at the end of the day. This is your 
um, opportunities complete the placement and it doesn't matter where you do your registration portfolio because again like Ain said earlier just because you've completed your portfolio in one discipline doesn't mean once you become qualified you can't go into another area and um, again it was the same with me I did mine in hematology and transfusion but then I actually um, got my role as a biomedical scientist in biochemistry and then I managed to move back into hematology and transfusion um, I wanted to mention as well, when it comes to writing the CV, so again, I've got a specific example for this. Um, I was quite lucky to kind of get into a job straight away. Once I'd completed my CV. Um, some of my friends weren't quite so lucky. Um, we completed a placement at the same time, um, but I had been into my job about three to four years um, and she was still looking. And eventually, I think she gave up and uh, went into working with the admin at university um, and I happened to bump into her one day and she just said to me oh, I've, I've given up now um, I guess it's just something that I'm not going to go into ever and as I asked her have you you know have you been looking actively on the NHS uh, NHS jobs website she said yeah I've applied everywhere now um, and I said to her have you even been shortlisted for an interview and um, she was like no um, so at that point, I then said to her, well, it might mean that you need to look at your application again. Um, and I said to her, you know, do you want me to have a look? And maybe I can ask my manager to kind of um, check it as well. And I had a look and it was, I think it was about 14 pages. Um, and as soon as she gave it to me, I said to her, there's way too much. And she was like, but I don't want to cross anything out. It's all relevant. But it was just too much. If you imagine um, an advertise on the website and someone has to sift through 200 applications and they're all 14 pages each, you'd, it, it's too much time. You basically want something that's two pages, like Ain said, and things that stand out, bullet points, have a look at the job, um, job description, person specification, look at what it is that they're looking for and adapt your CV to that, your application form. Um, so I had a look at this uh, CV and I remember just crossing through lines and lines of things. It was basically uh, explaining everything that she'd learned at uni. Um, you know, just going through the syllabus and kind of listing everything that she'd learned. So I crossed it all out and I said to her, look, um, I would just take all of this out. That's my opinion. Um, so she went back, took out a load of it, but then she put back loads in again. She said, I really don't want to take this out. I feel like it's relevant. And, that's mine I'll pass it on to my manager and just get her opinion on it I'm just going to put the charger in because the battery is on um, yeah. so I said so I'm going to give it to my manager then because obviously she's got experience in shortlisting and interviewing um, and I did and he gave exactly the same feedback um, he set this thing out and said if you, if you delete all these bits you can get it down to two pages um, so she did she listened to my manager um, and then the first job that she applied for in all them with that application she got the job and she's still there so mm. it just goes to show that sometimes yes it's relevant but at the same time you don't want too much on there you want it to be key points concise um, and just for it to stand out make sure it maps to the person specification and job description got any more questions yes yeah okay i'm going to hand over to amy now I think um, just while we're waiting, that that concept is quite true in life, isn't it? You you um, spend your working life kind of developing the skills and uh, knowledge and behaviours that allow you to do your job, um, but you it's very rare that it's appropriate to to go through them all one by one. And so to to be able to really distill it into a concise format is it, quite a skill, isn't it? And um you know your, your first draft is certainly shouldn't be your last uh, version you, you know um use the staff around you the career service and uh, us lot to help you proofread and improve your documents yeah i agree lucy and i would say on that to also 
make use of family and friends with it because I think we're all guilty of going, oh, I did this amazing technique in the lab and I want to tell everybody about it. But when I get someone like my mum to read my CV who has no scientific background um, but does work in recruitment, she'll go, well, what, what's the relevance of that? that? That is almost like showing off on your CV, which of course you want someone to know how skilled you are, but you could cover the huge paragraph, like Tamina just said, with a line saying competent in PCR, for example. Um, and it's important to rein yourself back in, isn't it? Because I think we see it a lot. People are so excited about how much they've learned at university, which of course is brilliant. Um, but from an employer's point of view, and building on what Ian's posted in the chat, you know, make it concise and make it easy for the person who's shortlisting you to see how you hit everything they need you to hit. Um, and I know we've already got a lot of CV um, feedback available. I'm quite happy to read over any CVs that you want me to look at for placements or the job applications after. And you've got career service, you can ask us. I think the career service have got a really fancy um, CV checker now, um, particular software that they can use to support that. But um, correct me if I'm wrong, Lucy, Liam, but um, yeah, you've got a lot of support available to you there. So I would just say to make use of it um, and make use of these key skills that you've got from people around you. Um, and don't worry if they give you the feedback like Tamina had to do, you know, it's 14 pages, it's far too long. That's okay, because you've clearly made a good effort, um, but it's about using that feedback in a positive way. Um, and I would say that's the same for interviews as well. You can get better, even if your feedback is bad, you can use it as a positive thing then and move forward with it. So the last thing that I really wanted to cover today was how do I actually go about getting a job? Um, Oh, Danny's just said he's happy to be emailed to. So you've got quite a bit of uh, feedback potential there. So how do you get a job? And I know Tamina just touched on this with um, the NHS job site. That is updated almost every day. Um, and you can sign up for alerts within a specific area. You know, you don't have to get alerts for the whole of the UK. If you don't want to go and live in Cornwall, you could sign up for just alerts in Greater Manchester. Um, I think you can set your radius to sort of 10 miles, 30 miles, 50 miles and go from there. I see emails coming out all the time from Salford Advantage and the career service. Um, I've seen things posted on Blackboard. So even if it's not during term time, keep an eye on these sites. You know, it might just be the job that you're looking for or you want to get into and it's come up at a good time. LinkedIn, I've seen quite a few jobs posted on LinkedIn. Um, and I think increasingly employers are using that to advertise. I know our trust use it to advertise NHS positions. Is it the same for you, Danny, me, yeah? So that's a big one to get into and I would start building up your LinkedIn, you know, the, these professional social medias that we've talked about, the same as Twitter. Um, I saw Danny this week put out a post for Milton Keynes. Um, things get retweeted all the time. It, in biomedical science, a lot of people know of someone who, who will do something and then they go, oh, I know someone else who's like that. And it just sort of spirals from there. So this is why we, we bang on really about the social media professional presence um, and utilising that to the best of your abilities. Really. Um, move on to the next one. And then once you've found that job, um, preparing for interviews, so again, I think we've covered a lot of this, but just to reiterate, reading the job description and personal specification, whether you do this online or whether, like me, you might want to print it off and go through it with a pen and a highlighter, go through and make sure everything in the essential and ideally in the desirable as well, like Danny talked about, make sure you've hit it because remember this person doesn't know you and you might be the best person for the job, but unless you show them how in your application, then they aren't to know, are they? Th this point I made, but I think Danny's already covered pretty well, of thinking of scenario-based answers to help you remember key points. So we've done a couple of mock interviews lately where I know that people are fantastic and I know that people know the answer but they get so nervous, they just can't get their words out. So I find that 
thinking of a scenario to answer the question and being able to relate the point, um, like Danny said, to hit the answer that you want um, works pretty well. So whether that's um, a busy scenario where you're waitressing, I always use waitressing because I was a waitress, you know, talking about time demands, teamwork, um, working extended hours, all of these things are really important for biomedical science careers and you don't ever have had to set foot in a lab to be able to come up with these scenario based answers so I would suggest using that particularly if you get nervous and don't forget about your buzzwords so when we are point scoring in interviews and I know Tamina's covered that in more depth sometimes people have to say a certain buzzword to be scored higher for points so Danny's just um, posted there that his um, bonus buzzwords are cost, so that's your health and safety requirements, RIDO, which is reporting of accidents and incidents at work, ISO 1519, which is the UK standards that we're accredited to as labs, IBMS and HCPC are big ones at trainee level, um, the registration portfolio, I know to meet in a touch before in UCAS and those type of requirements too, um, and asking for a tour, I always find that the tour can sort of make or break somebody's interview. So we've taken people on tours before thinking, oh, their interview went well. And then they've been so rude to people in the lab or just really quite abrasive and how they would slot into the team then becomes questionable. So remember when you're on your tour, even if it's not with the person that interviewed with you, even if you handed over to an MLA or another BMS, that you are still being assessed. It's like an extended part of the interview that they can't point score, but that gives them a, a good clue as to how you'll slot in. Um, it, Danny and Tamina, if I open it up to you both now for your tips for interview, is, is that okay? So, so one of the things I picked up from Amy um, was that she the big one for me is, um, as well as being well, professionally fit for the role, um, we are all humans and we all like to be around people that we find friendly and that we, we, we you know, are, are nice to be around. So what, when, when Amy's saying that when you, when you come to your interview uh, and when you go on the, the lab tour during the interview or after the interview, um, definitely, definitely, definitely you come across professional, come across nice uh, because you, you will, whilst it's not a formal uh, part of the application, humans judge um, and you are going to be being judged um, at that point and, you know, when you have a full-time job, you're spending more time at work than you are potentially with your partner. You know, so you want to be working with people that you you want to be around for that you know for that many hours every day. Um, and it's the same for employers. You know, they, they want they want to bring somebody into the team who will fit into the team. who's not going to create problems. Um, he's not going to create problems within the team and and, and create animosity between um, people. He's going to be rude. Um, and just the basic thing as well, I think we can all get stuck into studying for all these interviews, looking at all the interview tips and, 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 and all these sort of um, pathology specific stuff, but we, we could quite easily forget all the basic things, showing up on time for your interview, showing up uh, dressed smartly or appropriately for that interview, um, manners, and good morning, thank you for your time, all that kind of thing is all possibly not even part of the formal uh, point scoring system. Uh, I just go back to the fact that humans are humans and they will judge you. When you've got two very close candidates and you're choosing between them and you know one was really friendly with the, with the chat and you could see them fitting in the team and the other person, like Amy said, was rude, uh, wasn't really showing any interest, wasn't asking questions, wasn't listening during the tour. Um, it, it makes it easy, doesn't it, to, to, to decide who, who you're going to offer that place to. Um, and just to go back to the previous slide about um, sort of Twitter and, 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 and that kind of thing, um, having a digital identity in 2020 is really important. And um, there are st there is a, there's a mixed population, I guess, within the technology world at the moment. Um, there's, there's the ones who are pro social media, pro um, digital identity, and then there's, 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 there's the others who still haven't quite grasped it or have never really been interested in social media. But it, it, it's here and it's staying and it, it, it's becoming more, even in my short career, it's, it's become more and more popular. Um, we even advertise jobs on Twitter now. Um, I actually got a job through Twitter. This is a bit of a funny story and I don't expect this to ever happen to anybody ever again, but uh, I was fairly active on Twitter and I was tweeting professionally. So 
tweets about hematology and that kind of stuff. Um, and I won't name them, but I, I, I got a DM from a chief BMS at a hospital, uh, and they, spoke, they, they sent me a message and said, Danny, I'm seeing your tweets and stuff, would, would you consider applying for this job? Um, and they sent me the link to the NHS jobs, and I had a look at it, and I actually, I applied for it, and I ended up getting that job, and I ended up working it. It was the best place I ever worked. Um, and so that's sort of my little Twitter success story, and a little, quite unorthodox, and I don't ever expect it to happen again, but these things do happen, and that came about because I had a bit of a presence in a digital identity, and somebody knew who I was, uh, and that was purely through Twitter. You know, I, I've made friends and contacts with people in labs that I've never even been to that city. Um, so it's amazing for networking, amazing for opportunities. So I am very much pro Twitter and pro LinkedIn and any form of social media, actually. Um, and I would, um, as long as you use it appropriately and professionally, definitely advocate using it. I got in touch with Danny through Twitter and spoken to Dean a lot on Twitter about you know, not seeing these people in person. So you can make a lot of professional connections through your social media. Has that one charged up any to me? Because I think this one's on its last legs. We'll swap the laptops back over again. Because you've got the charge in it. Yeah, so you go mute this one. Hi, yeah, so um, I've actually managed um, to find again some of the interview questions and I'll talk you through um, the way that we do it. So when, we, when we're recruiting and we're interviewing the candidates, we use a form with all the questions set on there. Uh, we had three member, members on the panel for the placement students, we split up the questions between us um, in turn. But the way that we do it is that we score each candidate. Um, so we've got a zero to five. Um, and what we're looking for is when, when we ask you a question, um, we're looking at how you sort of answered it from start to finish rather than just give us what we've asked. Um, so it's kind of outlining the situation, give specific examples um, of when we ask, um, you know, what experience have you got with such and such a situation. So outline the situation um, and the tasks that you were responsible for, the actions that you took and the results of it. I'll give you um, some specific questions. So one of the ones I mentioned was about knowing the values um, given your background research. So the first question we started off with was, um, what do you know about the CPP and SimLab? So we're a joint venture um, uh, with 50% NHS and 50% private. Um, now two of them, the first two candidates were able to answer those really well. Um, so we had six candidates. One of, uh, one of them kind of didn't know much about CPP and SimLab, which is about the values of the Christie. Um, so again, didn't get quite the score that um, we wanted, um, and three of them didn't really know. Now, the way to handle those types of questions is, yes, even if you don't know about it, the answer that we don't want to hear is no idea, which is what, <laughs> which is what a couple of them did. Um, it's more about adapting yourself to that situation. Okay, you've not researched it, but at the same time say, can you explain to me what that is? Um, or that's something that I need to go back and look at after the interview. Um, show the interviewers that you're quite keen to learn. You're not going to be able to answer everything. At this stage, you don't. You might not know the answers to everything, but what, we want, what, we, what we're looking for is that you're willing to learn. Um, some of the other questions was, what was your motivation for applying for the placement? Again, um, I think just knowing why you're applying for it um, and make sure it's relevant. Um, so one of the question, one of the answers that we got, there was kind of no knowledge about doing the uh, portfolio. Um, it was quite strange because you're here to do the placement, to do your portfolio, but a couple of them wasn't aware. They kind of applied to do the placement. Um, I've got this opportunity to come into an interview, but not actually thinking about the IBMS or the portfolio. So that was quite surprising. Um, talking through relevant work experience, so like I said before, outline the actual situation, um, so what work experience you've done, and even if it's not relevant, adapt it to um, the job that you're applying for. Um, give us an example of when you've had to follow a specific procedure. So when we're working in the lab, a lot of our processes are following standard operating procedures, so we're looking at how, you know, you've got attention to detail, following specific processes in um, in a step-by-step -step manner. 
um, you know, looking at how you can follow his instructions and understanding why we need to follow a consistent process. Again, another example of when you've had to work to a deadline. So we had one candidate saying they've never had to work to a deadline. That was a really difficult question. But again, adapt it to the university. Maybe, you know, you've got deadlines for coursework, you have exams, you might be working a part-time job. Um, adapt it to that situation. Um, you know, talk about assessing your priorities. And then another example was talk about a process where you've had to make improvements. Again, show evidence of proactivity, engagement, and lo logical thinking. Another question that's really popular is um, describe a situation where you've worked effectively as a team member. Again, adapt it, even if it's something to do with, um, say, like a presentation that you've done at university, you know, leading on that teamwork, all of those um, examples, you can adapt it to the placement opportunity or whatever job you've applied for. Um, customer service um, and then obviously we talked earlier about um, health and safety one of the questions we did ask as well what precautions do you think should be taken to reduce the likelihood of infection and injury um, and we were really surprised that um, no one talked about vaccinations which is quite surprising given that you know we're in the middle of this pandemic um, but yeah I hope that's been useful I'm going to pass you back to Amy do you want to try it? or do you just want the laptop Right, so we've been passing you between three laptops for this session, and this is the last one going, and it's on its last legs. Um, so I think now is probably a good time to wrap up the session. Um, if anybody has got any questions that they want us to try and get through before we finish, I'm happy to do so. All of us are still here, even though it says Amy's dropped out, Danny's dropped out. Um, yeah, and these tips to sort of get into placements, employment, anything really in life then um, i'll just whiz through them so experience is invaluable so i think we've covered a lot of this but apply for as much work experience placement extra lab sessions these workshops networking do as much as you can write yourself a plan and um, if you're someone like myself who likes to have things on paper i like to tick off goals as i'm going and that can be quite helpful to show that you're taking achievable steps and um, you need to choose something that you enjoy doing there's no point doing a job for the money to me um, because you'll, you'll be quite unhappy there. Like Danny said, you spend more time at work than you do with your partner or your family. So um, choose something you enjoy doing and, and don't be afraid of change. So um, all of us really have gone into roles, you know, unknown and I really enjoy the teaching that I now do. So hopefully that will show you that it's OK to try the different things. Lucy, did you have a question? I did, um, yeah. Um, just just going back yeah. to um, the advice about Actually, providing. Back over, if that's okay to me, to where you're sitting, because this has started buzzing at me already. <laughs> Move the charger on it. Has anyone got any other questions for any of us? Sorry, can you hear me? Hello? I think we did have a question come in from Twitter about how long portfolios take to complete um, and it's quite variable depending on the person so I would say I did my portfolio in 14 weeks. Danny how long was yours? One year. One year for Danny and Tamina. Tamina's was one year as well and um, it's variable I have seen people take three years to do them depending on what's going on in their personal life um, yeah, yeah, not here we haven't. No, but some other universities do PTP routes where they do them a small chunk at a time throughout their entire degree. Um, oh, I've just seen Lucy's sound isn't working, sorry. Um, but if anybody else does have any further questions, you've got all of our emails and contacts. Um, it might, yeah, Danny has his own uh, hashtag on Twitter, asking, gasking, which I just think it's amazing every time I hear it. Um, and we are all tweeting about the things that we're getting up to today. It might not surprise you after we've banged on about Twitter. Um, so, yeah, maybe head over there and get involved if you find that easier for you. Um, Lucy, did you want to say anything to wrap up? I know you're having sound issues, but if I can pass anything on. Can you hear you. me now? I think this has been a really valuable session and um, 
I'd just like to say thank you to Tamina and Dan for their advice to you. I think it'll be really useful to you um, and hopefully you know, it'll give you the step ahead that you need. Okay. I think Lucy's sound still might be having issues. So I'll wrap uh, that up there, thank everyone. You. Thank you for attending. It has been recorded, um, so you can come back to it if needs be. Um, if any of your friends or colleagues on your course need any further information, please do let them know it's here as well. Um, and for those of you on the team sites, I'll put links up on there so that you can um, you can get back to me. So, okay, thanks everyone.